Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> and uh, welcome to uh, IoT Lockdown, uh, Battling the Botnet Builders. I am Adam Englander, and uh, I work at Iovation, actually here in town. Um, and I uh, hope everybody has a nice little break and they're ready for some, some security. It's a little sparse crowd, so if you have any questions in the middle, feel free to bring it up. It's pretty interactive if you want it to be. Um, I don't have a problem with that at all. So the first question I have for everybody is what happened on October 21st, 2016? Anybody know? Right, that happened, all right? <laughs> This is an outage, all right? I was actually in Las Vegas, so I was uh, right about there when it happened. Um, my company's data center here was about there. Our other data center in Seattle was there. Uh, you could not connect to our services. We could not connect anything to manage it, monitor it, do any of these types of things. Um, this was one of the first DDoS attacks I've ever seen or any kind of attack that the entire world noticed. Right, because you couldn't get to Netflix, you you couldn't get to Gmail, right? You couldn't resolve names, um, and some places had issues with traffic. So other pl places had issues with just not being able to resolve DNS. Um, and this was a tough day. I was in the middle of a conference when this happened, trying to figure out what the heck's going on. Stuff flying around. It's a good time. And what this was is this was a distributed denial of service attack on Dyn. Um, which used up to 380,000 IoT devices. All right, this is why it was so hard to stop, is there were 380,000 non-related IP addresses slamming Dyn, generating up to 1.2 terabits per second of DNS requests. All right, this massive flood of data coming in, producing, even while they were mitigating it, it was still producing 50 extra normal traffic. Uh, and this was one month after basically the exact same thing happened to Krebs on security. So Krebs on security was attacked by the exact same botnet, uh, maybe not the same devices, but the same, basically the same software and the same attack, except they weren't doing DNS flooding. Uh, they were doing HTTP requests. And it was so bad, it was double the worst thing that Akamai had ever seen. Akamai actually dropped Krebs on security from their network because they were doing it pro bono and they said this costs us too much now that you're being attacked like this. We cannot afford to deal with mitigating assaults on your, on your site. It is our job to prevent this from ever happening again. Right, this was 100% IoT related. Uh, I'm assuming that you care because you're here. Um, there are a lot of other people that aren't. Um, so I'm going to try and help you out a little bit and uh, maybe give you some information that you might not have, uh, hopefully a couple tricks and tips um, that you can use. And I'm, I'm assuming based on this conference that we're all doing embedded Linux development. Um, some of these things may apply to non-embedded Linux, but embedded Linux is where these attacks are coming from for the most part. Um, because there's been a wave of IoT development, right? IoT um, development with embedded Linux, it's made developing and manufacturing more accessible, right? We can rapidly prototype something um, and just do it on a very easy development board, move it over to a production board running embedded Linux super easy, super quick. And it's reducing time to market, right? So it's becoming more and more popular. You, might, has, you have more access, right? You don't have to be able to write stuff onto a chip in C to be able to do IoT development. Uh, and you can do that with things that actually go into production now. So that's the exciting, the brand new dawn of a new day for IoT development. There's also security benefits for embedded Linux, right? Linux provides facilities for fantastic security, right? The, the internet runs on Linux um, or a Unix variant for the most part, right? There's some, there's some of the world that runs on Windows, but it's not a lot. Um, it's not a lot of things like Facebook, which runs on Linux, um, uh, Google, which runs on some of their own stuff, kind of weird, but mostly some sort of star edX um, type variant. 
and these people have, and over the just, you know, the decades that's been around uh, with the other conference that we're kind of uh, joined up with, you can tell there's a, a lot of stuff for making it fantastically secure. Uh, and because of that, there's numerous resources that exist already for implementing super secure Linux because people have been doing this for a very long time, hardening these things, making these things very, very, very secure. But in all that, we have to remember two things, right? I, I'm, I'm come from, sorry, I come from a security background. So I know that number one, you will be attacked, okay? If you have something connected to the internet, it's being scanned right now. There are good actors and bad actors right now that are scanning every single IP. They literally just go through the numbers and they connect to it and they start knocking. Is this here, is this here, is this here, is this here? And it just records it. Sometimes they're looking to see, just be able to, researchers to find out information. How many DNS servers are out there? How many people have an open FTP port? Um, they may come back later and say, do you have security on FTP? Do you have security on SSH? <clears throat> so just being on the internet, you will be scanned and the likelihood that you'll be attacked is 100%. Um, and you will be exposed to a zero day vulnerability. Okay, if you don't know what a zero day vulnerability is, that is when the, if you, if you have good actors and you have uh, a good ecosystem, someone will find an issue, a security issue with your system and they will alert the community and say, hi, I'm not gonna tell anybody else, but I found this really terrible vulnerability that you have. And I would like you to fix it and I'm going to give you X number of days to fix it before I tell the rest of the world because it's a really bad vulnerability. And the world is vulnerable and they need to know this. Sometimes they don't fix it. They decide it's not a problem or they decide that they're just not going to do it. And sometimes it's just not found and it's not a good actor that exposes it. And you find out after a hack happens. Uh, a year and a half ago, Heartbleed was one of those, right? If you were doing anything with Linux, Right, you notice that everybody, all of a sudden, everybody started freaking about this thing called Heartbleed. Right, it was a vulnerability in OpenSSL that was a zero-day vulnerability. You found out the day that you needed to pit, the day you need to fix it, um, and so you had to apply all these crazy patches to prevent the problem before OpenSSL actually came out with a with a fix. So these things are just going to happen. Right, you're using Linux, it's just going to happen. It's going to be way better than what you could do if you wrote your own operating system, but it's going to happen. It's part of the it's part of the system. The other super important thing is you have to know your adversary. And when we're building small products that do small things, we don't think very large, right? We don't think about, I mean, there's the lone gunman, right? There's someone who's just trying to hack things and they hack things for the sake of hacking things and they, they hack things so they can say they're really cool and they broke into stuff, right? They have no really other ulterior motives. They're just kind of seeing what they can do, right? These people age, range from the age of 10 to 90 um, they're usually not terribly dangerous, but they probably don't follow the same protocols that an ethical hacker does of letting you know before the rest of the world, right? So they might find something and just, you know, spit it out to the world that they found this terrible vulnerability, but not tell you beforehand and give you a chance to fix it. There's local criminals. IoT has a very specific different problem uh, that most of your other Linux brethren don't have, is that you're not giving information about a specific individual. When you think about what you're doing if you have, let's say, um, you're writing a, a thermostat or some smart home or smart office piece, one device by itself doesn't do much. But a lot of devices throwing out data allows criminals to have a profile of tracking the garage door opener, the thermostat, the lights. Oh, I know when they come home. I know when they leave. I know when they're not expecting to be coming back because they have different parameters on what they set things. So if I'm not going out for the day, I drop it 10 degrees. If I'm going out for a week, I drop it 60 degrees, right, on the heater, because you're not that worried about it. Um, and if they drop it really far down, that means they probably don't have a dog, right? So there's a lot of things that uh, one little piece might have anything to do with, but if you put all this stuff together and you build a profile of someone that a local criminal just leeching off of information being sent on IoT devices, they have the ability to create profiles to be able to know when they can do an attack. Um, whether that's a high profile individual or even just a low profile individual where it's just kind of standard theft. Hacktivist groups. Um, I haven't seen that a lot in IoT, but it, it does happen and it's going to happen, right? If you have, uh, there are groups that think that certain things shouldn't exist um, or that things are bad, right? There's a, a few 
fairly recent examples, Ashley Madison was a big example of that, um, where they got hacked because someone said, you're a terrible person, you're doing terrible things, uh, and you shut down or I expose you. And they didn't shut down, they got exposed. Uh, so if your devices are being used in some place that someone doesn't like, they may use your devices to do terrible things to people. And whether that, whether depending on what side you're on, you may be really upset or really happy about it, but the likelihood that it's gonna be used on something that you're gonna be upset that it happens, that your device was responsible for it, is pretty high. Because uh, there are, are angry people about everything. Um, competitors. So competitors, um, either competitors of yours, right? They can find these things, they'll find these bugs, these vulnerabilities, and inform the world that you're not secure. Uh, or competitors of people who use your devices using your devices to gain access to their network and gain information. Organized crime is a big one. Um, for Organized crime tends to be something where they're doing extortion, where they're finding out information about individuals and using that uh, to extort money from them so it's not released. Uh, and then nation states. So nation states, it's, it's a really kind of weird thing. Um, nation states just collect a ton of data. Um, because they're just they just want to collect all the data they possibly can because they have the computing resources and power to use that to make determinations. So um, they just use just massive, massive data collection, whether it's our government or somebody else's, they're all doing massive data collection. And if they can use your devices for doing those data collections, you're probably not doing your users a, a, a favor by giving them the privacy that they're expecting that you think that you're giving them. So now that we kind of know that, we start talking about security. So security is like an ogre, it has layers. And I hope somebody gets that joke because it's one of my favorites. Um, and it's, it's layered security, it's defense in depth, right? This is not something that is specific to security. This is something that is specific to defense, right? If you go take a look at a castle, it has a moat, three walls, and a keep because they know that any one of these things can fail, but all of them probably won't. Um, and the way we do that in defense um, is that we do it through layers in the system, right? So your applications running on an embedded analytic system has layers. And what we have to do is we have to understand these layers a little bit, and we have to understand how each one of these layers really takes place and what the things that we can do to help protect them um, at the network, the application, service, file system, and operating system level. If you're, if you're like me, you're probably not a great sysadmin, um, but you're writing things that run on a system. Uh, whether that's you're doing IoT, there's, a, there's another huge problem that's coming up with containers, right? The Docker world. You now have people that are writing applications that are running in containers that run on Linux. They don't really pay attention to the Linux side. So <laughs> containers and running in these systems on Amazon and Google have their own problems. Um, the same that IoT has because neither of them are really good at you know, none of us are really good at, at being system administrators and being Linux security specialists, but now we don't need those other people to run our systems. Uh, and not having them is creating, is creating some havoc. So at the operating system level, you have to have a patching strategy. So there are vulnerabilities that you're going to have, and you're gonna have a device that's out there in the wild somewhere you have to come up with a way to be able to patch the operating system. And patch the operating system in a manner that is secure. It's something that a lot of us don't think about, right? If you, I don't know how many drones I have <laughs> that have no way to update their, their firmware or to update their actual operating system, right? They're running on a Linux system and they're always gonna be on the wrong Linux system and it's whatever vulnerability it has when I bought it is the vulnerability it's gonna to have to the end of time um, because they did not give me an upgrade opportunity. Uh, one way, one of the things that you can do um, that's becoming actually, we might be able to leverage some of the container world uh, is minimal distributions. So there are Linux distributions out there that are super tiny. And they're meant to be super tiny because they're meant to take up as little memory as possible. Uh, because in the container world, if you can reduce the amount of stuff that's rolling out there in containers, you can help application developers stop doing as many terrible things. We can leverage that in the IoT world as, too, as well, right? One of the things that you normally do is you figure out, I've got a standard Linux distribution, whether it's Yocto or Raspbian or whatever the case may be, and what you want to try and do is start paring down. Well, the other option is, is you can start with nearly nothing 
and then add, add the couple things that you need. Because most of us, we don't need SMTP. We don't need FTP, right? We don't need all these other services that come with it. We'll normally provide that in the application layer. The number one problem with, if you take a look at the, uh, the statistics on how these botnets actually happened, and you actually take a look at a lot of the early drones and how they were actually hacked, it's because they used a default username and password for every single one, and they never changed, and there was no way to change it. Right? You've got a Linux system that has a user root, and that either root user either has no password, or it has the same password for every device. Which means all I have to do is get into one, and I can get into all of them. So my suggestion to you is to find a way to do some randomization with that. If you can print out a serial number, you can associate a random value with that, and that value can be the random password. So that if they manage to get into your source code and find the default username and password, they don't find everybody's password. They have to go crack your database and go find a few things. Right? That's that defense in depth. Make it a little harder for them to get through, make it more expensive, make it more difficult for them to get in. Uh, and require strong passwords. So um, authentication modules uh, allow you to, uh, inside of Linux, allow you to require strong passwords. Don't let your users hurt themselves. Uh, you probably hate it as much as everybody else, right, when someone requires a strong password that you don't remember. Um, but we're talking about devices, and if the users probably should never be able to connect through the terminal, right? We, we're supposed to be building applications so they never have to connect to the terminal. Um, so why would you not want to have a super secure password for that one case where someone might have to do that just to recover their system somehow? At the file system level, named application users are a really big deal, right? When your application is running on this device, it should not be running as root. Uh, Depending if you're using something standard, right? If you're using like a Python server or if you're using Node or maybe you're running a, a JVM or if you're running C, um, the other ones are a little easier. They're pretty well stand up, but you can basically, you start your application as the root user connected to port 80 or whatever port is a, is a high level port that you need root access for. And then you just spawn off another fork and that fork is at a much lower level. And that fork's gonna process your request. Uh, it's the same thing that Nginx does, the same thing that Apache does, the same thing that the, uh, the Java servers do. You start up as root, but when you're actually running the code, that fork is not running as root. Because if you give somebody root access, they can do terrible, terrible things. Basically, anything that you can possibly think of, they can do it. Restrict your application to only the files necessary to run. Right? It's super easy for development to give yourself access to everything so that you don't have to start figuring out file permissions. Um, and that's fine for development, but once you start actually getting ready to put your application out there, you've got to harden that up and say, what does, my what does this actually need access to? Should I be able to write to Etsy? Right? Should I be able to write to the configuration files for the entire Linux system? Absolutely not. Right? If your application needs to write there and it's not for just the initial setup, it's probably a bad thing. And avoid write access wherever possible. There may be certain issues, instances where your application has to write, but limit those as much as possible because giving your application write access is giving it the ability to change things at, at that operating system level, at the application level, possibly even overwrite your own source code. Right? If you're running something that's not compiled, uh, if you're running something like a Python or JavaScript, right, someone can just rewrite your code and now you're executing all new code, um, which is a really, really bad thing that you, you don't want to give people the ability to do. Once you get outside the file system, you get to service security. Uh, this is a problem with application servers everywhere. Uh, and one of the things that I, I've done over the years um, in application development and uh, more recently in IoT development is reduce local dependencies. So, um, and the reason, way that you do that is you don't process things locally if you don't have to. Um, a lot, of, a lot of IoT devices were finding the best way to do that is you're going to have some sort of proxy to go do all these things. You're connecting to an external service to manage. Um, don't use SMTP locally. It may be easier, but now you've got an SMTP server running on your IoT device, right? And that IoT device is going to be accessed, and if you've done something bad, someone's going to go, great, now I've got a Linux computer I can start sending spam from, right? We all become part of the spam problem whenever we do that. Um, 
FTP, SMTP, right? If you don't need to get SSH access, just don't even install it, right? Um, like I said, most of the time we don't, users should never have to go to a console to run our applications. Um, if you do have services, and it's something that you do have to have, so you have something that's completely separated, it's not gonna be um, connecting to anybody else's systems, it's not, uh, it's a you know, single standalone device that needs to be a single standalone device, require authentication for those services. Your application knows where the authentication is, but someone can't just get out of the box and start using it and setting it out. Um, it makes it a little more difficult on your side because you have to pass credentials through to SMTP or whatever the case may be. Um, but just make sure you have them so that someone can't just start sending things to your IP address on port um, 2727 or anywhere they want to and just start sending 25 SMTP. Right? Don't turn yourself into an SMTP transport. It would be a really bad day. Um, and be as secure as possible with service data. Understand the data that you're putting in these services. Understand that most of the stuff when you're talking about the Linux side, it goes into a file that is text and can be read. All right, SMTP goes into a queue. How's it go into a queue? It's a file that just gets written to a directory. So if there's super secret information there, you've got a problem because it's accessible to the file system. So be as secure as possible with that data. If you've got data that's secure that you're going to be sending, encrypt it. We'll get into that a little bit more. On the network security layer, if you can do it, right, and if we're all talking about, you know, the, it seems that IoT for the most part is moving towards um, kind of dumber devices with a smarter central brain at the location. Uh, if that's your case, you don't even need inbound connections, right? Everything's outbound. You should be connecting to whatever your brain is uh, at that particular time, and you're going to proxy through that to talk to the user. Um, that is the most secure way to do it, right? Not everybody's going to be able to do that, but that is absolutely the most secure way to do it. Do not allow direct connections to your device ever, right? You have a device that you're going to tell it to connect to, and you know what that device is, and you're always going to connect there. No reason for anybody to come in. But again, that might not be your situation. If it is, Restricting inbound and outbound traffic. Restrict, you know, there's no, if, if you don't have port, if, let's say you have to have an SMTP server, right? For whatever reason, you've got to have an SMTP server. Don't allow inbound traffic to that port. Um, you, you just don't want to do that. Because you don't expect anybody to be sending SMTP to you, right? You're just sending it out. If you're not going to be having, if you're not sending out SMTP, Restrict SMTP going out, right? It's a, it's a very common thing that's just restrict the, the data going out so that you don't, even if someone is running code on your system, if they found a vulnerability, they can't do bad things by going out on something that you shouldn't be using anyway, um, that your application doesn't use on that device. Prefer pair Bluetooth, right? Um, for some of our stuff, we need LE, right? It's absolutely essential that we have LE. If it's not absolutely essential that you have LE, but you want Bluetooth, using standard Bluetooth creates a very secure pairing connection that cannot be, that cannot be um, you, someone can't connect to it without having the correct keys, right? There's a key exchange that prevents someone else from being able to do that. When you're talking about LE, you just get a device ID, and any one of us can bring up light blue on our, on our uh, phones, we can copy that ID, and we can say, hi, I'm this ID now, and start talking back and forth. When you use standard Bluetooth, the pairing process is a key exchange, and it, it actually encrypts the data going back and forth, so that you can't, you can't sniff it, you can't um, pose yourself as that device, it's much more secure. <clears throat> not everybody can use it, not everybody has the ability to do it, but if you're doing Bluetooth, think about why you're using LE and not just standard Bluetooth. And if you are using um, standard Bluetooth, challenge response, so that you at least have, you know that this isn't happening remotely, that somebody's not trying to spoof Bluetooth, or they're not on the other side of a wall trying to connect to your device. They have to be able to see an actual, uh, an actual value that they're gonna have to put in to be able to uh, complete the challenge. Which brings us to what we all do, right? Now we've got through the kind of the basic stuff of here's how we would protect the system, but now we get to our application. I assume that we're all application developers. We'd be in the other rooms uh, with all the Linux folks. So we have to know what we're preventing and do as much as reasonably possible. 
And that, that's always a difficult thing in security, <clears throat> is that we want to be as secure as possible, we also have to be easy to use. Um, that's always a struggle anytime you get through that, is making it easy to use, but still be fairly secure. And again, with your application, you have to have a patching and an update strategy that is secure. So you have to be able to update your code on your device. How do you do that to make sure that somebody else can't do that on code that you don't want on the device? We'll get into that in just a minute. So here's the things that you're preventing. Account hijacking, right? Uh, sensitive data exposure, escalation of privilege, denial of service, and remote code execution. These are the real big ones. Uh, these are the things that are, the terrible things that are going on every day. Um, sensitive data exposure, right? The way that you prevent that is you have to start getting into the terrible world of crypto, right? Crypto is confusing and it's very hard. Um, I may be giving a talk on crypto on Thursday. I haven't got the response back. They said they wanted me to do it, but I haven't heard back yet. Um, but that's how you protect your data, right? Protect your data in transit. Now, an easy way to do crypto in transit is TLS, also called SSL. You should not be using what's actually SSL anymore. You should be using TLS um, because SSL in all of its versions is no longer secure, but we, it's just something we call it, right? We call it SSL. Um, those protocols are available to you straight through OpenSSL or whatever library you want to use on your Linux distro. So if you're sending data out, and you have the networking capability and the processing capability, crypto uses power, crypto uses CPU, crypto uses memory. You're talking about chips and embedded code on chips, that is really hard, but when we're talking about embedded Linux, you probably have the memory and the CPU to be able to do that. So think about it, think about why you're not using SSL to connect back and forth. It's a little more difficult and you're gonna have to figure a couple more things out um, but it's not that hard. There's a lot of information out there, especially along the lines of your distro, whatever distro you're using. And it, mean, it makes the world a difference. It means that when you're going in connecting somewhere, you can do validation to make sure that you're getting the actual response. Someone hasn't stuck a little uh, router in the middle of that, and they're just changing the response that's coming back to you and putting code that you want to, don't want to execute on the system. And protect data at rest with encryption. If you have things that are you know, that you don't want anyone else to be able to just get on the box and see, you want to encrypt the data that's sitting there. You want to do your best to protect as much as you can. Again, it's defense in depth, right? You're protecting it at every single layer, even down the application, and then your application has multiple layers, right? You have a network layer, you have memory, you have file system, all those types of things. And so one thing that you can do, which, again, it's a little more advanced, is certificate verification of your fingerprint. So when you're doing SSL communication back and forth with another device or uh, outside on the internet, when you're going over SSL, you're using a certificate. This is a public-private key pair. And you're making certain assumptions. It's telling you that you know, this, is my cert this is the authority that gave me the certificate, and you go and validate it. Everything's great. But if I'm going to perform a sophisticated man in the middle attack, I'm going to give you a valid cert that is not the cert that came from this one, from a certificate authority that somehow through the chain proves out to be okay. Or if you've done development with self-signed certificates and you forgot to turn off the verify SSL flag, super easy to hack. Uh, one of the ways that I do that, we do this a lot at, at my company, is that we use pinning where we say that I'm only going to allow a certificate from this certificate authority to validate um, my communication back and forth with the server over SSL. Again, it is a, a little more advanced, but if you have a device that's got information going back and forth that is important and secret, you really should think about it. Yeah? I'm a little confused by this, and maybe, maybe I'm just naive. Yes. Do people really not verify the authority that's coming from? Oh, them? sure, all day long. Sorry. I'm not following what you're Right, so. Uh, so a lot of times when people are developing, now let, Let's Encrypt has made this easier. Self-signed, Right, right. And so if you're in development and you don't change your code to verify after self-signed, then you're wide open. Um, but even if you validate the cert, even if you validate the authority, if you have an old, so what ha ends up happening is if you've got an old distro, right? These old distros have these old search, these certificate authorities. 
if you're using an old distro that hasn't been updated and someone has gotten the private key for a side authority that's in the list, they can now impersonate all of these different things. And that happens from time to time. It's very rare, but it does happen. And those things go for good money on the black market. Um, to be able to say, hi, I'm a certificate authority and this certificate is good. Uh, but like I said, it's, when you're talking about this is kind of more nation state or very organized crime uh, is going to be doing these kind of attacks. But it, it has been done. Um, and you can't protect against it. Yes? So TLS won't, uh, isn't uh, realistic in, in a lot of situations when you don't have a, a TCP connection, for example. Correct. So I guess uh, there, you know, are there options for you for kind of other than TLS? Uh, what else would, would be uh, realistic there? So certain protocols are going to allow some sort of TLS. So you can either do some sort of, uh, you, oh, sorry, that you can create a, a tunnel over TLS and then use UDP over that. Point-to-point um, -point UDP, you're kind of losing the whole idea of UDP at that point though. The other option is that you can encrypt your data, encrypt your data um, that's going across. So that you encrypt the data before it goes into transit. And if you're like me and you're really, really um, concerned about that stuff, you don't just use TLS, you encrypt the data on top of it. Um, because again, there's gonna be a zero day vulnerability, right? And someone's gonna say, I found a vulnerability in SSL, open SSL, where I can just bypass all of your validation on your certificates. So um, you could use some of the things that, that I use as a paranoid individual that you could use in every day is that you encrypt the data before it goes out. And there's, a, there's some stuff at the end of the, on this where if you're doing that and you're doing kind of more binary data, which is more prevalent in IoT, because you want smaller packets, um, you can do kind of a CBOR, a binary object representation, and there's a, an offshoot of Jose, which is uh, the JavaScript object signing and encryption um, that uh, keeps it at a binary level for being able to do, uh, provide libraries to do encryption of just binary data and pass along and validate it. Did that answer your question? Okay. If I get way too complicated, you don't understand what I'm saying, please just say, like, just let me know because I, I, I forget sometimes that not everybody understands all this stuff. I apologize. So encrypting data. <laughs> um, if you don't want attackers to have access to it, then encrypt it, all right? Uh, sometimes it's super, super, super secret um, and you don't want anybody to have it. If you're recording information, right, that should not be available to anyone except for the individuals that are collecting it, they may care enough and you may care enough to encrypt it when it goes across. And use the strongest encryption that's feasible. IoT, we all have restrictions, right? We only have so much CPU. We only have so much memory. Encryption takes up CPU and memory. And we can't just, you know, it, you have to do what's reasonable. Uh, and with most of the chips out there that are using embedded Linux, you can do something that is secure, right? You can do AES-256, which is perfectly secure, perfectly quick. Um, you can use RSA-2048 on most of them and you can kind of use the combination to get super secure and super speed um, to do that. So I, I always remember that, the, that if you're sending data and it's important, it could be around forever, right? And if it's something that's going to be uh, more along the use of user information, person identifiable information that's collected, uh, or things, biometric data that's collected, biometrics is the, like, you really need to watch out for biometric data to hold on to that really well, because that never changes. And just because you're encrypting it today, what we thought was safe five years ago is not safe today, right? Everybody got these little warnings on our browsers and everybody had to update their uh, SSL search recently to 2048 keys instead of 1024 because Google wouldn't allow it, right? <laughs> There's a reason for that, it's not secure anymore. So when you're taking something like biometric data, that has to be safe forever, or at least as forever as you can make it. So, um, always use the best you can, the highest level of encryption that you can, because it's gotta live a long time. Um, just try and think of that when you're doing this stuff. So digital signatures. Um, digital signatures are used to verify data. So one of the things that you can, one of the ways that you can keep people from changing your code and being able to run it is with a digital signature. So if you s send your code uh, for a patch, you can sign that code, you can stick a file on there with the signature, and then you can verify that signature against the code whenever you start up to make sure the code has not been modified. And there doesn't have to be any information on your, on your device 
that actually gives you the information to recreate a signature. So when you're talking about um, asymmetric key encryption, a public key is enough to verify a signature, but the private key only has enough information to create the signature. So you can create the signature um, from your central repository where you're getting your updates from with the signature, and you can verify that it hasn't changed. And there's no way that anybody's going to be able to recreate that. So that's super awesome way to make sure someone hasn't modified your code, gotten into your system, and given it something else to run that you don't want. Or they haven't found a vulnerability in your application to write new code to execute. Um, you can also do that in memory if you're really worried about those types of things, right? It depends on what level you want to get at, but there's a lot of things that you can do. And then sending data in transit. How do you know that you, your data hasn't been changed in the middle? If you're not worried, if it's not secret data, right? You're not worried about whether anybody can read it, but you are worried about whether or not somebody changed it on the way, you can sign the data as you're sending it and you can validate that signature to make sure no one has messed with the data coming in. That it's good, valid data, that's what you're expecting to be, and it's what it was supposed to be. So account hijacking. Uh, this is actually number one in the OWASP top 10. Um, again, application passwords. So, uh, and just user credentials in general. So we call it password hashing. Uh, we call it password hashing because that's what people understand. But if you're using a hash for passwords, it's a bad thing. Uh, if you're using MD5 or SHA, whether it's SHA1 or SHA2, even with a salt, salt makes it a little more difficult. Um, you should really be using some sort of key derivation function. Uh, and key derivation functions are PBKDF2, uh, bcrypt, scrypt, argon2i. All right, these are all available in basically every Linux distro with OpenSSL. You can get PBKDF2 out of the box, uh, which is not as good as the others, uh, but it will do. It's way better than using you know, a simple hash password. Um, it, the ability to crack hash passwords has gotten so fast that they've stopped making rainbow tables. Right? A rainbow table is just like would come up with every permutation. So they go, oh, there's the password and there's the actual the value it's supposed to be. Because that is so large and the amount of time it takes to just actually read them in and go through them and find it, it's faster just to crack it now. So uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah? So uh, do your users a favor um, and make sure that you're using you know, some sort of key derivation function. Um, like I said, PBKDF2 comes on almost every distro of Linux with OpenSSL. Um, another way to prevent uh, account hijacking is secure the initial setup via hardware or force wipe. Right? So there's only one time when you can reset a password. Uh, and that's either going to be that you have to physically be there with the hardware, and you can put it in that state, or, hey, if we reset this, we reset this. Right? Um, you're not going to be able to gain access to the information that's in here by resetting the password because there's not going to be anything left. So as a user, you better know if we're going to change the password on here, it's going to be completely gone. Um, like I said, you, you still have to kind of, you know, use, usability versus security. You know, what information is on the device? What are they going to be able to do? You have to really kind of think about that. But if you've got something that's, you know, super important, you know, think about what can happen when, they, when that password reset happens, right? Everybody forgets their password because now you're doing strong passwords. So now nobody remembers their password. So now they always got to reset their password. And what are you going to allow your user to do? And what uh, threat are you putting out there by someone being able to just do that for them? You know, one of the super popular things on the world right now is just, oh, I will send you an SMS message uh, with a special code. And uh, it's super easy just to, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do just through Social engineering, where I can take over your phone number today, in an hour. I can take over your phone number and get SMS texts. So you have, it's important when you think about security to think one level up. Don't think about yourself. Think about somebody who's like super important. Right? I'm just some peon. Right? I come here, I, I write code, and nobody wants to hack me personally because I have nothing for them to take. Right? Um, but the code that I write, could be used by somebody who actually does have something people want. Uh, and that individual's life could be completely ruined by me writing bad software. And that's something that I have to take into consideration every day. Um, and an important thing, too, is alert for changes to accounts. Right? If someone goes and changes, um, if they do a password reset on your system or they change the configuration 
and you have the ability to do that externally, send an alert saying, hi, I got changed. If you change me, that's cool. If not, you should really like freak out because somebody's doing something and doing something weird. Yeah? Did you make that picture or is that an actual picture somewhere? That's an actual picture. <laughs> Google Images is an amazing thing. Uh, yeah, you put in any question, it'll come up with stuff. I, it's really crazy. So nonces are super awesome. Um, and what a nonce is, it's a really weird word. I have no idea what the origin is. I should probably figure it out one day. But it's something that can only be used once, not none. Um, but it's a single-use token. And if enforced properly, it does so many things. Right? It can make sure that that request only happens once. So one of the things that you can do is you can basically keep running the same request over and over and over again. Um, and finding out what bad things can happen. Or you can try and hijack and do kind of cross-site request forgery if you have, if you have a web interface. Um, also, not having to go get the nonce first before they process the request. It's half the processing time they need. There's a lot more processing. If you just need to go start slamming some web page and trying to see what combination works, that goes really fast. If you've got to read the web page, parse the web page, get a value from the web page, stick it into your thing, and then, and then process, that is incredibly more expensive to a hacker. Um, and a lot of the just default hacker tools won't be able to do that. So you can protect yourself a lot just by using some sort of single-use token if you're having to submit forms so people can't just try and just wail on your forms all day to find out what the, uh, what's actually broken and, and the one spot that you forgot about that gives them access. But the important thing for them is they have to be cryptographically random. This is a really kind of weird thing. Cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generators. All right, that's a very big word that they shrink down to C-Spring. Um, but the reason for that is if most, most software, if you ask it to give you a random value, it will give you a random value. But it's based on the time that it gave it to you. And a smart attacker can actually recreate those and know what they're going to be before you generate them because of when they asked for it. So they can actually generate things that are, that are going to come valid without having to actually use it, validate it, or do any of those things. Because all computers, um, there's no actual random number on a computer. It's just a list of values. <laughs> and where it starts and which one it picks is based on information that it has. And the fastest way to do that is to take the current time, turn that into an integer, find the number that starts there, and that is the number that you pick for your pseudo-random number. Cryptographically secure adds additional information. The current temperature of the CPU, um, whatever information that it has, uh, bus speed, possibly the operating system version. It depends on the operating system and what it's going to do. But there's way more better ways to get something that is pseudo-random. Right? No such thing as random in a computer. It's all pseudo-random. But so cryptographic libraries or dev random, those are going to be cryptographically secure. And you can, you can count on those. And if you don't want to have to know which one it's going to be that's going to be secure on your version of Linux, you can always uh, kind of cheat using one of the libraries that's going to give it to you. Because they would. And they should expire. So in order for a nonce to work, um, it has to be associated with a certain amount of time or a, that, it, that it will be valid. Otherwise, you can just, you have to hold on to that value so they can't send it to you again forever. So if in your request, um, or even in generation of your nonce, if you can mix it with some time, that'll be super helpful because then you don't have to hold on to it forever. Right? If you just want to say, hey, my value that I'm sending is the, you know, the time, the nonce, it's going to go away. And you can, if, it's, if there's a way that you can validate that it hasn't been modified through a, like a signature, uh, it's a much smaller window that you have where you have to hold on to the nonce. So replay and denial of service. If you have a device that is a home security device, you don't want someone being able to load that device with so many requests and so much data that it can't actually send out an alarm when somebody breaks in. Right? If you have something that's monitoring um, the temperature of a room that has sensitive equipment, you don't want somebody to be able to jam that up so it doesn't tell you when the, when the heat gets raised up to 200 degrees and someone fries out all of your equipment, right? Bad actors will do bad things, uh, and they will find the simplest ways to do it. 
And a lot of times, the simplest way to do it is to send an invalid request that you're going to process anyway. Uh, and that's what a denial of service is. And a replay is taking a valid request and playing it over and over and over and over, and over again. Um, so that you have to process it over and over and over again so that they don't have to think, right? If you, um, the initial part of hacking is just, I'm going to just try and do something super easy and see if I can do bad things. And then if they can't do it then, they have to, they have to evaluate whether or not they want to take the time to try and take you down. So the important thing is, is that you at least make it a little difficult for them. Um, and there's a couple different ways that you can do that fairly easily. And that's either by tracking utilization and identifying things that are weird. So if, like, if, someone's, if you have a system that is, uh, has an endpoint that's perfectly valid to go configure something, it probably is not going to happen 100 times in a second. Right? So if you track that, oh, this same IP hit this same endpoint to update the system 100 times in a second, you can cut them out because they're not doing normal behavior. The other thing is you can do, which is a fantastic trick, is called a honeypot. And so before I told you, um, remove all these services from your system and don't give access to them. But sometimes what you do is you remove the services, but you keep the ports open, and you listen to those with your application. Because no one should ever connect you at port 25. If an IP address connects you at point 25, you never listen to that IP address again. <laughs> because they're not connecting to your app, they're just trying to do something terrible. So you can set up these nice things like on, you know, if, you're, if you listen on a non-standard web port, right? If, you, if you're able to do that, um, then if they come to you on the normal web port, then they're, they're trying to attack you, right? Or if they try to connect over SMTP, or they try to connect over SSH, or they try to connect over Telnet, right? There's scanners out there that will try all these things. They just try every port that's known, a couple of the known off ports, right? 8080, 8000, 9443. Uh, they try all these standard things to see if you're attackable. And if you listen on those ports, then you can determine they're bad actors. Now, mitigating those, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. One of the ways that you can do it is you can respond to them as if you had done something. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to keep hitting you. Now, you're not spending any processing time. You're just doing the, the initial very small check. You normally, you'll, take, you'll make a, a hash, a, a SHA, or an MD5, a very quick hash of the IP address. So you can go look up in some memory table and say, yep, this one's bad. I'm not going to do anything with it. Return 200 or return whatever is valid for Telnet or whatever your, um, your application is doing. The other thing that you can do is you can just not respond to them at all and just lose the connection. So they're going to think that, oh, I got no response back from this port. There's nothing there. So if you're using something that's doing asynchronous I.O., um, and I, IoT is mostly asynchronous I.O., um, you can then just end that, right? If you don't tell it to do anything with the response, you can just end right there. It's not going to take up any of your resources. It's not going to take up any of your connections. But they never get a response back. And eventually, they're going to time out. And they're going to say, there is nothing on this port. So you can do that on your actual port. right? If you see them come in at 443, then they come in on port 80 or port 443. Or they come in on 25, right? A port they're not supposed to be on. Then all of a sudden, they come here. And you say, nope, they went to port 25. They're a bad actor. I'm not going to respond. They don't think that you have anything exposed on the web there. It's a really, really cool way to just shut them out. Uh, but it does require um, either you being in control of the threads or some sort of asynchronous I.O. for you to be able to not lock up a connection until they time out by not responding. Any questions about that? Yeah. So is this all stuff that you, you would set up with uh, like your system configuration? Or is there uh... So this is something you would set up. So if you have an application that has a web that, that, that's going to be accessible externally. And so let's say you have a, a web admin yeah. for your device. You would also listen on port 25 on your application. Sure, yeah, I, I, I understand right, right. The, the mechanics. I'm curious if there's a specific instantiation uh, of this technique that would serve as a demonstration. Like, is there any application that does this now? There are a lot. <laughs> um, I know that. It, my applications do that. Um, there is actually an entire honeypot. Like, if you, there's 
there's actually some IoT stuff that's getting used for what's called a, a, a honeypot network, um, which is used to um, just kind of throw them everywhere. As a security company, we actually put honeypots on every segment of our network to see who's coming in and identify them kind of on a larger scale. Um, but I don't know of any applications that will have source code that you could view offhand. But basically, it's just I listen to the port. I just don't create a function for the response. I just work. So it's going to update the IP tables. But the only and the issue you have there though is that you have a Python script that has root access. Right, you have something that's accepting incoming requests that now has root access. So it, it can't write, it can't connect, you can't, how are you updating IP tables without root access? Okay, okay, sorry, you're right. So they have net admin access, um, which most of us that don't know the difference between net admin and root are probably gonna set it up as root. Um, but again, you're giving somebody very high, you're giving a script that has, that's exposed to the internet a very high level of access. Um, but that is that is absolutely one way to go about it, and there are some uh, some stuff out there that's configurable that you can do that with. Um, I, I'm, I don't really suggest that when you can solve that in your application. If you can't figure out how to do that, and it's probably it's definitely better than um, exposing everything on the planet um, and do that for IP tables. Um, but like I said on the honeypot side, uh, I would say that you're going to listen in and just drop the response from there and understand who the actors are coming in. <laughs> Right, but then you, but eventually, right, you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of IPs in your IP tables, and how does that slow, much does that slow your system down? What's that? Correct, but then when it comes to port 80, you don't know that that's them again, right? So with the, with the honeypot system, it's I'm going to take your request on 25, I'm not going to respond to it, but I'm also not going to respond to you on port 80, because I know you're a bad actor. Right, so that's, that's it's stopping a denial of service on your actual application. Yeah, IP tables, you can absolutely just shut everybody off on port 25 or all this type of stuff. Um, but what you're on a honeypot, what you're trying to do is you're trying to suck them in to find out that, uh, because they're just going to do a port scan, right? Anybody who's going to try and invade your system is going to start doing a port scan unless they know where your application is and they're, they're doing a directed attack. So the first thing you do is a port scan. They try and find out what's available, right? Because they're not attacking your device specifically, they're attacking a location or just an IP range. And they're going in there and trying to find this particular thing to, to attack. And if you expose these things out there, they're gonna say, oh, now I've got things I can go out later. So now I've got SMTP, let me go try this one. I've got SSH, let me go try that one. Um, I've got port 80, I'm gonna go try these other things. I'm gonna start hitting with web attacks and trying to do SQL injection and all these crazy, terrible things. Um, but a honeypot will allow you to kind of mitigate that before it starts happening. It's very difficult to IP spoof and get a response back because the route, the network doesn't know how to come back. So, I mean, you can only get so far going that way, right? And that's that's a pretty sophisticated attack outside the network, right? It's very doable, but then again, you have to decide which one is like, that's a pretty sophisticated attack, right? Doing IP spoofing inside a network is a fairly sophisticated attack. Um, especially, you first have to get in the network. But again, it's one of those things where you have to kind of weigh it out is, um, what's the likelihood that I'm going to have someone deny, and do you care more about denial of an individual being able to talk, connect to something or my system not being available, right? So to prevent a DDoS, it's, yes, you may not be able to configure me for a little while because somebody's done something, but it doesn't mean the system is stopped, all right? So it depends on what you're, what's more important to you and what you need to stop more. Does that make sense? Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to like, uh, answer a little bit. So it's very, very hard to actually stop any kind of DDoS. So what you told, uh, like let's say derivation will be like sign, uh, clean attack. I can do a handshake. I don't have to even complete the like full going through inside. I just initiate and I create large amount of initiation of handshake. Mm -hmm. It's a bad shape. Right. That will 
chat to you in the no matter what. So the IP uh, failed to ban, did I post these things? Uh, most of them, I don't even do that. I can do a DNS reflection attack. I can keep like creating a lot of different types of IPs, and uh, they will like, take you down. So there is no like right. solution to. Uh, but sin flooding is something you're not. You would stop at a network level. Yeah, I mean, right. You can, you're not going to stop it at a device level. It's going to be at a network level. You're going to stop sin flooding, right? Yeah. I mean, but uh, you do a, like uh, just uh, handshake attack, the famous sin attack. Right. Uh, that will go through. Right. And again, you can't stop everything, yeah. right? Uh, but what you can stop is you can stop people from finding vulnerabilities on your port 80 if you don't allow them to get onto port 80 when they tried port 25, right? You can't stop everything, right? And that, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can stop. Um, and you can try and prevent things, but if somebody really wants to get at you and they find, find a vulnerability, it's going to be there, which is why you have defense in depth. Remote code execution, don't execute unverified code, right? If you don't know where it came from, if you haven't validated that it's good, we talked about that kind of like in the patch, that you can put a signature there to make sure the code's valid. Don't run it. Um, and then if you're storing data in a database, right, there's ways to verify that you're mitigating against SQL injection. Right, if you're using a, you know, a, a local database, whether it's uh, SQLite or you're using one of the variants for uh, key value stores that you're doing for speed, make sure that you're, val you know, in your data, make sure that you're not doing something terrible like on Node.js and having uh, a, Mongo, a local Mongo store that allows you, that doesn't validate the difference between an integer and a string and creates a buffer that will just spit out people's data. Um, so be careful for those things. That's really dependent on the different ones. Yes? Secure bits only secure is what you stick in there, right? So it, you, can't get, you can't get at it once it's in there. And that's going to be dependent on your operating system and how you're going to be able to execute inside of there and whether or not your virtual machine or your code executes in that environment. Um, what I'm talking about mostly is what most people are doing is you're going to have to patch your code um, or you're going to get information you're going to be sticking in the database, protect yourself against a SQL ejection. The trusted code environment is... It's particular and different, and it's going to be based on the vendor on how they've implemented it. I know that there's some standards coming out around that, but everybody seems to be just a little bit different so far, um, at least in the stuff that I've seen. So really quickly, I want to give you some tools um, that'll be, that some of these will be super helpful for you. So Internet Engineering Task Force, right? We're talking, we keep talking about crypto and signature verification and all this kind of stuff. They have two standards that do that stuff for you. One is called Jose, and one is called Cose. One is using JSON, and one is using CWAR, which is the uh, binary object representation. We all care about small packet sizes um, and not having to move between text and binary. So there are libraries written around these standards that will allow you to encrypt and sign data in transit and be super simple. Uh, same thing with storing data locally. Um, the Open Web Application Security Project, okay? This is used by websites everywhere. Um, it's also used by uh, IoT. They have top 10 vulnerabilities. They have all the information you need to determine what your vulnerabilities are and how to actually fix them. All right, so if you think there's something I want to do, go there. Um, bug bounties, okay. These are super awesome. You can pay the best hackers on the planet to come check your site and tell you what's wrong with it before the bad guys do. All right, um, in my company, we've had one for four years. We've paid out about $2,000 in serious bugs that were found in the securities in our systems. And these are literally people who write the books, all right? They do it for a little bit of money, a little bit of recognition, part of their career path when they get up. Um, using ethical hackers is a great way to keep your stuff secure. Uh, I, I really, really, really suggest it. And there's some uh, places out there um, like bug crowd and things like that where you can get that information and they will manage it for you or you can do it yourself. So uh, if anybody has any additional questions, it looks like I'm running a little bit late and I apologize. <laughs> um, so you can just basically look up bug bounty ethical hacker. Um, so there's like there's uh, bug crowd, there's a few others. Hacker one, yes, hacker one's one of them. Uh, like I said, we run our own because we have security researchers and experts, but if you don't have that, there's, a, there's sites out there that will help you do that, get it set up, setting up your boundaries and what they're allowed to do, what not allowed to do, and get you in contact with them. You might have to find out what Bitcoin is. 
<laughs> to be able to pay these individuals because they don't normally live in the United States. Um, so, and if you have any more questions, um, don't feel, feel free to just grab me, but I'm gonna let her get set up so she can go because I'm running late. Thank you.